Louisa, Alan and Emily, it's incredible that it is actually Friday the 13th, 2018. <laughs> We've been talking about all this uh, a lot. I think it's safe to say that it's actually a, a great success so far. Incredibly grateful to be, uh, to, no, 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 incredibly grateful to be part of this. Um, I'm not gonna bore you with all the details about blockchain because then there will never be a coffee break and there will also not be a lunch and also not a dinner. Um, but I'm gonna talk about the use of immutable records uh, in the art world. And more specifically, of course, in the, in the art trade because that's where I'm from. So, um, on the right you see someone who you already have been introduced to, Hasso Plettner. Um, I was lucky enough to have met Hasso Plettner in 1998, when I was still an art dealer. I owned a very small consultancy firm and the chances of someone like me to meet Hasso were minus uh, three million. Um, but by coincidence, we did meet. And what was the reason why Hasso started to, build, to buy art from me and, and why did he actually respect my advice? There was only one reason, and that's trust. Um, his trust was based, of course, on very subjective matters because he hardly knew me. And for those in the room who know Hasso, we all know he has absolutely no time, uh, so he never really gets to know you. So he makes up his mind very, very fast. A digital guy, it's yes or no. Um, I'm from Holland. Um, he likes Holland. He used to go there on vacation when he was a child. So I think it has something to do with that. Um, the other thing is, you know, in life you have to trust someone. But what happened, as you all know, now, in those days, Hasso absolutely didn't want anyone to talk about his art collection. Hasso became a very, very big art collector, and it was all done in a very short period of time, and we managed not to talk about it. Um, after a year, I quit my own little company, and I joined the Wildenstein family, and that's where you see in the middle, you see the Wildenstein Gallery. And what you see on the left is me. Don't tell me you don't recognize me. I know it's quite a while ago. And I'm wearing one of those generic art dealer's coats because it's all about trust. I'm now the chairman of TEFOV. If I have a board meeting and I have 20 dealers in the board, there are 20 coats like that hanging on the coat rack. So trust is based on what? On not knowing all the facts. The only reason that you have to trust someone is that you actually don't know everything. And of course, he didn't know everything when he was buying Impressionist art. He became the biggest collector in Impressionist landscapes. Um, it's safe to say that it became an addiction. And um, after the third visit to the Wildenstein Gallery, uh, he came actually with not only his, uh, his partner, but also with his dog. And the dog was named Claude. So, a certain kind of addiction, a good addiction to Impressionist art was definitely there. Um, so what, what do you do if you buy a $20 million painting or a $10 million painting or even a $20,000 artwork like a photograph or something? Um, you have to trust the person who gives you the information. And it's sort of mind-boggling that if you buy a Monet, for example, um, that you're lucky, of course, if it's in the catalogue resume of Wildenstein. If it's not in the catalogue resume, you're a little bit less lucky and you have to trust a process that takes place to actually get an attestation from the Wildenstein Institute. A little bit more about that in a sec. Um, so a lot of trust is involved and it's also symbolized, as you can see, in the architecture of the Wildenstein Gallery. And it's also symbolized in the architecture of a lot of libraries. I mean, the Frick was a private house, so that looks a little bit less imposing. Um, on the other hand, if you look at the Frick library, that really looks like, uh, like, a, like, a fort, like a fortress of knowledge. And that's exactly the same with the public library. Even the lions are sort of, my God, don't come too close. We actually know everything. This is our information. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to use the word, but there's a word that comes to mind. There's, al there's almost a certain arrogance here about the knowledge that has been assembled, not only in that building, but more importantly by just a few people. You're, you're part of that elite group of scholars. Um, and Ahmed, who's right here, um, you remember two years ago that we were at the Authentication in Art Conference in The Hague. There were two scholars and they had been doing exactly the same kind of research for five years and they found that out 
because they had a lecture right after each other. And it was a bloodbath. So scholars, like dealers, art people, try to keep all the information to themselves. So that's what a relief what we've seen the last two days, right, with all these images of artworks. But things were changing already, and things are changing rap rapidly. If you look at the Trek en Bibliothèque in Paris, it's all about transparency, all about openness. It's actually a nightmare for the books, but anyway, let's, let's, let's stick to the symbolic part of it. Um, this is now how at least the French nation wants you to believe how their national treasures are shared with people and how important information is. Um, I had a, a gig, I can say, at Sotheby's for two years. Uh, Jennifer is right there. <laughs> I don't think this database is still up, but when I joined Sotheby's, I became the worldwide head of private sales. And um, what happened in the auction world is that some 10 years ago, they started to incentivize people working at an auction house uh, with a commission on a private sale. That's a way that they thought they could make more money. So what are you trying to do? You're trying to kill um, group spirits because an auction is all about working together, collaborating as fast as you can, share as much information as you can, because in two months there's the auction and you better sell what's being sold over there. A private sale is the complete opposite because all of a sudden you can actually make a bonus. You can get a commission. So everybody sta started to hurt all the information that was not only at Sotheby's, that's everywhere where you actually throw an incentive of commission into a, into a company. So, I mean, I don't know if you've ever bought a short shirt at Barney's. Uh, they work on a commission base and that's why they really try to get away everybody else who's trying to help you. And there's this one very aggressive person who tries to deal with you. So what happened was none of the information was shared among colleagues. And because of that, what happened, uh, let's, let's use Christie's this time as an example. Someone from Christie's could offer an artwork to one of his or her clients that had already been offered by 10 other Christie's people um, for different prices, uh, different sources, and usually in very, very opaque intermediates, intermediates to use in not, not to use the horrible world runners. Um, so you can imagine how important it is actually for your revenue model as an auction house to make sure that people start sharing information. Well, I was the one who said we need a database, a private sales database. It was all based on an Excel sheet. It was pulling teeth to get all the information, but it was sort of a rudimentary system to create transparency. So um, if you look at my desk, you won't believe it, but I'm actually someone who believes in order, in, uh, in, in systemizing things. And a code rack is, of course, the ideal way to do it. But it should actually look for art much more than this, right? I mean, for an artwork, there's a lot of credible information that's out there that can actually li be linked in one of these code racks for those living in New York. Uh, there's many commercials on television for this system. I'm completely intrigued by it. It's actually for people living in small apartments because if you've hung your jackets, you can remove, you can lower the one on the right and then the whole thing goes down. So it gives more closet space but it gives me a good example to, to show how important it is that data will be linked. Um, I'm fortunate enough to have a tiny farm in Italy and uh, less fortunate to be the owner of a car from 2005. It's a Hyundai. It's a completely beaten up car, but that car in Italy has a little document which shows you all the repairs and maintenance that the car has undergone over the last God knows how many years that the car is alive, is, is existing now. Um, that's a legal document. Uh, actually, my husband this morning told me, do you remember that we lost the document? Hold that thought, because then we were actually driving illegally for two years. It's that serious. The car also has a, a number, a chassis number. Um, so last year I thought, you know, we were unfortunately with a startup company, we don't spend a lot of time in Italy anymore. Maybe we should sell the car. And I went to a garage. And they told us, you know, it's 800, maybe 1,000 euros. So the lucky owner of my old car will know everything that happened to my car since the day it was actually produced. 
And for $900, you get a lot of reassurance that you're actually buying something. Not saying that you buy the right thing. You definitely don't buy the right thing if you buy my car, but at least you know what you're buying. Um, if you look on the right, you already know where I'm going to, right? If you buy an artwork, you not necessarily know everything, and there's absolutely no rules, there's no regulation that there should be such a thing as systemized, transparent information about artworks. So now comes the, the really boring part, and I kept, to, I, kept to, I kept it really basic, because otherwise it will be like a huge uh, publicity for artery, which it is already, of course, but still. So I'm not using artery here, although this is exactly the kind of model we're using. We're creating a public registry. Um, as you can see, the event is very important, because what we want to record, or what needs to be recorded, is that all the relevant events and the credible events in the life cycle of an artwork should be recorded. Remember the car. So that is um, an important thing that's actually possible these days. So what is, what is an event that you would trust? Um, for example, there are quite a few dealerships that do a lot of due diligence. Uh, the biggest auction houses do it. I'm chairman of TEFAF. Uh, the reason why, I'm why I am their chairman is because they also see that there needs to be much more regulation in the art world and they even try want to, 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 to make sure that people buying art at TEFAF or at Art Basel, for example, that they understand that they're buying vetted art, hence the big vetting committees at these trusted uh, art fairs. So you have to trust some people, um, but what do you trust? It's not like also trusting me not knowing information. It's actually showing people information that Sotheby's, Christie's, um, a risk mitigation company, or uh, another company that does like credible people who do like uh, valuations. That kind of information can be recorded. It can not only be, you don't need necessarily need to record it. You can even put it in a registry and you can hash the information. That's where the blockchain comes in into the blockchain. The blockchain is absolutely nothing, it's just a tool. Um, there are quite a few companies these days making a lot of publicity about blockchain, and what they say is that information becomes credible. Nothing becomes credible through blockchain. I mean, diarrhea in, diarrhea out. The most important thing is, what do you actually store through blockchain? And why? Because blockchain makes data immutable and alterable, and it timestamps data, just like that little booklet of the car, although this time you can't lose it because it's immutably connected to that artwork. Well, then you go to the next phase. You want people to see that information. You want to be able to, to know what is actually what the big dealers claimed about an artwork. What is actually if that artwork is also in the public domain somewhere visible at the Frick, and they have open link data. All, all those data you can link, and, and again, you don't necessarily need to link everything su through blockchain, only the most important information you can actually register in an immutable way. Um, what is the big problem in the art world? The big problem in the art world is that the owners don't want to be known. So the only, re the only way you can make something like this a success is by making sure that the owners of the artwork are not connected to that information. On the other hand, you want to make sure that they can prove that they are the owners of that artwork. Well, it's a pity that Professor Meinl is not here. Um, we have many conversations about legal trusted anonymous entities. And now we're like, what's that? I can tell you in a few years' time, we will all have a trusted legal entity if we can be trusted and if you have a little bit of money, because for example, your credit cards will change. It's a crazy system. A credit card has your name on it. I mean, why, don't it, it, sh why not your address and everything, right? You don't, you don't want to pay and always make sure that every, and, and you don't want everybody to know who you are. So if we created a system with Artery that ensures the owner, that the owner can never be known by anyone using the public registry, but the owner with login credentials, um, that he or she is the owner. Then you create a big incentive to gather a lot of information about the artworks because it's not as sensitive information anymore because it's not connected to the actual owner of that artwork. 
So the certificate of ownership is what I just discussed with Professor Meinl, um, the example that I mentioned, that is a way that you can actually log into the system as the owner and you can also show other people that you're actually the legal owner of that artwork if you can show in that you can actually log into the system to that artwork and if you can show your bill of sale. I mean, that's still what's necessary. So um, that is, in short, the system what we're building. So um, very grateful, of course, to Hasso Plettner because he is the one who started, at least in my life, to make me aware of the fact that tech and art can be united. Um, he's now a very well-known collector. You may all know that part of his collection is always on view in his museum, usually in the Museum Barberini um, in Potsdam. Um, usually his artworks are in juxtaposition with many other artworks from big museums on loan. If you are ever in Potsdam, you have to go and see it. It's incredible. Uh, one of the other entities that he's financially supporting is, has, is the old Wildenstein Institute, which has now become the Wildenstein Plattner Institute. Just as the days of the Wildenstein Institute, there's an iron wall between every, every other entity, like the Wildenstein Gallery or even Artry, because we are a for-profit organization. Honestly spoken, we're only burning money, but one day we will be a for-profit organization. So there's no connection there, although, of course, the Wildenstein Plattner Institute, but also the Frick, the Donald Judd Foundation, many other people create information that deserve to live immutably connected to an artwork. Well, a little bit of a warning here. Um, we've seen so much about image recognition, so much huge opportunities, um, which can only be the beginning of something special. I think we have to be very careful. What are we going to connect with what? And that's why I'm a firm believer in data integrity. That's the product that I cre have created, because the product is up with an amazing team in Berlin. And uh, as long as we think about data integrity, then it's going to be a great adventure to join as much information and immutably link it as much information to the artworks, because it's all about the emancipation of the artwork, and the artwork deserves it. Thank you. <laughs>